Okay, so today we're going to have a little update on the SNEA Storage Network Industry Association Storage Management Initiative, and I think we're going to talk mainly about uh, the Swordfish um, Management Standard, Storage Management Standard. So perhaps for those that aren't as familiar with it as others, can you just give us a very brief sort of you know, resume of what that standard is, what it does? Sure. The uh, SNEA Swordfish spec is actually an extension of DMTF's Redfish specification. So this, our spec itself really just focuses on adding all of the storage specific extensions. So we let DMTF worry about protocols and all of the underlying bits and bobs. And we that, that lets us just focus on all of the actual storage specific pieces. So we focus on you know, all of the configurations for anything basically above a drive that's directly attached to you know, a single drive, you know, single or one or two drives directly attached to a server. Anything above that is covered by Swordfish. So um, we work with everyone from direct attached configurations uh, that are building HBAs and RAID cards and want, you know, have anything more than a very simple configuration. Anytime those start to get very big, you want to go to Swordfish. And then we're also doing a lot of work with obviously external storage, things like that file systems um, that we've done historically. And um, a lot of our recent work in the last couple of years has also been focusing on making sure we have excellent support and are basically the management interface for NVM Express and NVM uh, over fabrics. So um, while they have direct interfaces when you want to bring them up and manage them at scale in, a, in, a, in an in a, uh, enterprise data center, um, attached in your systems, um, that's where you wanna bring in Swordfish. And we partner with, with the Redfish quite extensively so you get comprehensive management across server storage and fabrics. Okay, and you mentioned NVM Express there, and, you, yep. and also the fact that you, you sort of work with other, so can you just give us an outline what you do with them, and, and the, presumably there's some other industry partner organizations that you, you do stuff with, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So let me, yeah, let me start with our partnership with um, both DMTF and NVM Express. Um, as I mentioned, we extend um, Redfish, and so when we've started working with NVM Express, uh, it's actually a three-way agreement. So we, we basically lead the work bringing NVMe support into server management and storage management, because there are some cases where NVMe are gonna be very simple. But what we've done over the last couple of years is basically taken and put the two, the two um, specs side by side, or actually kind of on top of each other, because Redfish and Swordfish are, you bring in at the, at the top layer with your, um, enterprise and your data system and your system management. And then you have NVMe, um, the, the base specs coming up from the devices over your like PCI bus or, you know, um, at, at this level. And, and, we, and we basically built the bridge between those two things. So we have, we've done everything from mapping all the schema properties between one and the other as well as also writing documentation. So we've, one of our um, pieces of collateral as we call the mapping guide. So that allows somebody who's not necessarily super familiar with one or the other to come in and, and be able to say, okay, this property, what does that correspond to over here? And um, so we've got lots of material that talks about, about how to manage NVMe devices. Is there, they are storage devices, but they're just a, there's, there's a few, few differences from the way we've done traditional storage management. And we've mapped all of those things together. So you have seamless management and standards based all the way up from your NVMe devices um, using admin commands or MI out of band, and then putting Redfish and Swordfish on top of that. And so we, when I, I, I will frequently say Redfish and Swordfish because um, to, to us, it's all one thing. We cover you know, the storage portions of the schema and Redfish covers a lot of the base schema. So we extend wherever we need to. Um, we try not to reinvent any wheels anywhere, and but we focus on all those storage specific use cases like the NVMe environment, which is why NVMe Express came to um, and came to SNEA and as a as a way to lead that that whole mapping effort. Okay, and I'm guessing a, a logical extension, which I think is is fairly new to, is the the conformance test program, which I, in simple terms, presumably is where you're checking that 
everything works together and does, you know, if so, I don't know, a particular manufacturer says it does this, it does actually conform to your standard, um, et cetera. Can you just give us some, some, oh, that's a, probably yeah, wildly accurate, but in simple, but give us the, the actual, you know, how does it work? <laughs> It's a very good simplification. Um, so SNEA has actually had conformance test programs for management software um, for, for many years. We've had the, the SMIS conformance test program. And so we've basically taken that same concept and applied it to Swordfish. Um, so what we've done in order to be able to enable that is we've developed what we call a set of profiles. And a profile is basically a written agreement effectively between the clients and servers and say, this is the functionality that's going to be, that we're gonna implement as at a minimum at, at, for the standard. And that's what we test through the conformance test program. And so we have a set of, of open source based tools. Um, Redfish actually uses a lot of these same tools, a lot of the same infrastructure, but they don't have a formalized program around it like SNIA does. Um, we found this to be much more important on the storage site historically. And um, so what we've got basically are a set of about, you know, you can kind of think of them as, as little um, recipes that you can build and, and add on top of, uh, but we've got about 20 different uh, uh, profiles that uh, you, so we, that, that implementations can pick from and say, I want to do this set of features. I want to do this set of features. And then they can test those through the Swordfish Conformist Test Program and, um, and then advertise, you know, both compliance, vendor neutral compliance test validation. Hey, it wasn't just us, you know, SNEA says we did this too. Um, as well as then the clients can see specifically what's in there. Um, we also have a runtime feature that allows someone to tell at runtime what, what one of, what specifically of those features they're supporting. So they can tell both at runtime or they can go check the website and verify that, that those tests actually did pass. Um, so we're very proud of that. This um, We've developed, like I said, this whole thing on an open source based um, reference implementation. We've, we have um, a couple of companies working with the program now. Um, and what they're doing is they're actually not waiting until the end of, you know, that till their, their products are complete and trying to start testing. They're actually using the program um, and the test framework while they're doing development. So as they're developing, they're saying, is that, hey, are, is this what we're proposing to do gonna pass and we can run through and check and give them feedback. And, um, and so as they iterate through their whole development cycle to get their products out, they're able to you know, get closer and closer to with, uh, and, you know, and, and help them accelerate their, their uh, development at the same time, ensuring that they're building the right thing. So that's one of the features that, that uh, participating with our interoperability lab and our conformance test program early uh, can offer. And you, I think you said there are about 20 profiles. Um, is, that, is that sort of, for, for the time being, everything you envisage, or is that the first tranche and you know there's going to be you know, some more you've got to bring, or they just happen as new technologies and vendors do different things? And how, how do you see that? Um, yes, good question. So we had the, we've actually, this is kind of our second wave. Um, so I do envision that there will be more and um, customers can also kind of create their own based on kind of a pick and choose. So the way these are structured is we have a set of base functionality profiles and these include everything from, you know, base discovery. Am I advertising myself correctly to um, block provisioning? You know, what, what are the base you know, what are the requirements that I have to do in order to say I can advertise that I, I support provisioning? Um, and then we have, uh, you know, ones that get a little bit more complicated replication, all of these kinds of base features that you'd expect from storage devices. And then we have a whole set we've developed for NVMe as well. There's an NVMe drive. There's an NVMe Ethernet attached that drive. Um, and so again, these are cumulative. Those Ethernet attached drive doesn't, it just references the drive one as the base one and adds a few more requirements. So as implementers are going through, they can basically say, well, I know I built an Ethernet attached drive, but I also support provisioning. So I'm just going to also say that I support that one, this other little profile and bring that in. So we don't have to basically come up with, um, you know, these huge, long, completely independent ones. They're all these nice little chunks. Um, what we've been doing in the last, this last release, uh, version 1.2.4, that we're actually just in the middle of releasing right now, we've added... Um, 
about eight new profiles in this bundle. Um, they include uh, getting into a little bit more detailed functionality for implementations, things like access rights management, um, uh, connectivity management, as we, especially as we get into NVMe over fabrics, it's actually the same fabric requirements as for external storage devices connecting to fabrics. So we've made sure that those are standardized, but we've also specified here's the requirement, the base requirements and the functionality for how you do that. Um, we've also then gone back in and added some, what we call some um, aggregation style uh, profiles. So we have a couple things that are all, they're, they don't really have a lot of functionality in and of themselves, but they're basically, you know, I want those four profiles and that's your requirements. And these are good for things like JBOFs and EBOFs where all of the components are something else, but we can basically say, if you want it, if you're going to build an NVMe EBOF, um, you, you, your actual requirements are include you know, include these four profiles. And that's all nice and wrapped up into a single uh, single descriptor then. Um, so those are the kinds of things we expect to keep building. Um, I, we're, we'd like to, and are doing some work to reach out to the OCP organization on um, trying to extend. They've got server-based um, profiles now, and we're, we're looking at how, what we can do to take some of the work we've done um, and, the, and the basics here to extend that to cover, you know, storage attached uh, functionality in the OCP configuration. Yeah, um, I, I, it's part, and I won't say it's a problem because it's probably a nice thing to have, but do you find yourself sometimes wondering what you should be doing? What, you know, where do you draw the boundaries and, you know, where, where should you get involved and where shouldn't you? Or, or do you think you've got to, it's fairly, because it seems to me these days storage, as you say, and then you've got you know, the servers and then you've got the whole data sort of, you know, the, the storage, I get that, but the, obviously the data that sits on it is becoming important, which is a slightly separate, but obviously it's not unrelated. So yeah, if that makes some kind of sense. Do, it it you, does. The, it the question is to, kind yeah. of, yeah, the question is kind of like, where do you draw the line between what one organization does and what another one does? Well, we, we kind of, we fit, we addressed that through the alliance agreements. So um, let me talk about an, another set of work we've got going right now. Um, that all wraps up into the same space. We've got uh, some work going on around storage fabric management. Um, and we're working with five, four, five different organizations right now jointly. So this is work that's going on in the Open Fabrics Alliance, um, but we've pulled in folks from DMTF to, on the Redfish side, uh, Swordfish for the storage use cases, OFA because they want to help make sure that this is an open, you know, an open architecture that works across all different fabric types. Um, and, and then we pulled in both Gen Z and CXL as a couple of different fabric types that are that are um, enabled and working within this right now. And so in terms of who does what, in some cases it's the same people just wearing different hats because I also per participate and help develop the swordfish or the redfish specification. Um, but when we're doing an effort like this, what we actually do is we go through and say, okay, fabric management for storage, the basics are the same as fabric, man it's just fabric management, that's redfish stuff. So let's go make sure all of that's complete and then we can start layering on the functionality we need for storage. So and those little bits and pieces in, it's not something different. Um, these meetings are, and, and this work is kind of a great way to highlight that um, the work is this tiny little intersection between what all the or other organizations are bringing in. We're not reinventing anything. We're just saying, okay, here's the little piece that's not done yet. Let's go do that. And then feed that back in to any one of the four organizations that needs it. And in terms of the overall commitment to openness, I mean, I've been involved in the storage industry on and off for you know, a number of years, shall we say. And I know heterogeneous storage was talked about and, you know, sort of, or issues within the stuff and I know since then the whole open movement has gained massive momentum but do you find it now there is just sort of completely you know, if you like universal acceptance of open storage and everyone's working towards it or is there without naming names or are some vendors less willing to get involved in complete openness than others I mean just sort of observations 
Um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of question about how folks are, you know, should best engage is the way I put that, um, because there are a lot of things happening. Um, you know, within the, within the storage space, there's everything from uh, groups that are developing, kind of think of it as, you know, um, references, uh, you know, this is the, you know, they want to develop a spec or it's, it's not really a spec, it's more like a recipe book that says, this is the kind of configuration we want to put together. And they, they're basically uh, need to refer to other people's specifications. Um, and they don't really largely develop their own specifications. They, need, they still need standards groups um, and standards bodies to come in and say, what, are, what is the spec underneath this? Um, there's a lot, security has a ton of these same kinds of things. There's a tremendous amount of, of um, you know, sharing and overlap in uh, security uh, and security um, use cases that cross the boundaries between what the needs are for servers, um, uh, and storage instrumentation, and they're crossing about eight different organizations right now. It's it's very um, chaotic, but it's it's also so when you look at something like that and ask a company, you say, "Where do I go plug in?" It can be a little overwhelming to figure out where <laughs> what where the pieces are. But that's why some of these alliances are really important because it's not just Nia driving these; it's all the rest of these organizations that are doing that. Uh, so I've been talking a lot about the manageability space, but if I just talk about you know, um, store or security, which is also something that's very important on the manageability side, both, but from, we have work going on in, um, you know, uh, like OCP with this open organization there's in their, in their, um, they they really like to say, here's, here's what to do. And then the details you, you fill in from these different specs. And that's what's been going on there. So they're looking at, Hey, how do we do, um, attestation? So DMTF has a, has a really low level spec um, for how to do, um, you know, uh, attestation, you know, management based functionality at a low level. And so then over at SNEO, we can look at that and say, well, yes, we, we care about that. We don't need to define that ourselves. DMTF has that. We can look at how we build, um, how we build that functionality and we refer to those specs that are being developed in um, DMTF and in PCI SIG and in um, TCG. And so our, our, one of our other twigs, um, the object drive twig that's working on, you know, specifications for these more intelligent uh, standalone drives um, can just pull those in and they don't have, we don't have to go and, you know, kind of again, reinvent any wheels there. And it all gets pulled in again under this, this manageability um, umbrella where, you know, where it's not just Redfish and Swordfish, it's Redfish and Swordfish and SPDM and, you know, a, a, a handful of other different specs that all get put together to make a comprehensive solution. Okay, and in terms of, um, I think you fairly recently opened your, um, the, the storage management initiative, you, you opened your next generation lab. So I'm guessing that also contributes to, to the development of, um, you know, solutions, uh, or I, I'm assuming that, but tell me how it works. I mean, have you got some sort of sponsor vendors that put kit in there, or is it you, you specified it and then other people are welcome to come in and plug in their, you know, hardware, software into what you've got? How does it work? Oh, thank you. So, the, yes, we have, we've spent a bunch of time over the pandemic um, working on how we optimize some of our programs. And one of those involved, um, taking what we'd had in, um, in our tech center um, in Colorado Springs and uh, basically getting rid of all of the old stuff and focusing entirely on new stuff. So we've just opened the new SNEA Innovation Lab. Um, and it is, it is uh, we have basically all new, almost all new equipment but donated from vendors and are starting to build up again from that. Um, in addition to the SM Lab, we also support two other interoperability labs which I'll talk about in a minute. But for in terms of getting folks to engage with the, um, the uh, storage management lab, um, we are really quite open and we're, we're trying to work on how we enable some of these new technologies. Historically, it's been a great place for companies to come in, bring um, early prototypes of, you know, management software, sometimes even early prototypes of hardware, but, you know, we focus on manageability, uh, sit down, do interoperability, you know, try things out, see what works. Um, and then as the standards mature, 
um, bring in clients, um, bring in others to kind of work and, and have a place where folks can, can uh, play with multiple and interact with multiple uh, different types of, of uh, uh, vendor equipment without, um, you know, uh, worrying too much about, you know, about the scope, right? You, you're all within our lab, you're under our, our um, uh, NDA agreements. So anything that happens in there is really just all focused on working on improving everyone's implementations, whether it's client side or vendor side. Um, we also support for folks working with our lab, within our lab, that again, that early access to the conformance testing. So that could feed in to helping uh, the environments, everyone just able to improve their environments because they can run, you know, as their, as their implementations start to move along, they can, they can uh, run that conformance test again to just see how they're doing. Um, some of the other pieces, like I mentioned, we're working on it, trying to expand that NVMe, we've talked about quite a bit. Um, you know, we're talking about things like Ethernet attached drives, um, which is a, a little bit different than we've had in the past. So how do you bring that into the lab? You know, we're working with some vendors to say, okay, if you wanted, we're going to bring drive, just, you know, a couple of drives into the lab, what do you want, what do you, what do you need from us from an infrastructure to be able to support that? Do you need a server to, you know, or a, you know, a, how are they physically going to show up? You know, um, are they going to show up in an eboff? You know, when when in the cycle? You know, are you going to give us a standalone drive that we can plug in? So we need, you know, some sort of some sort of, you know, space in our rack that we can just lay drives and plug them in. You know, some form of infrastructure like that. Or are you working with eboff vendors? Are you, you know, how are we going to bring you guys in to start working on that? That's one of the things we're doing right now because. Um, with all of, with the Ethernet drives able to just directly embed Swordfish, they're like the complete opposite of big iron, right? They're little tiny iron. <laughs> and so we need to figure out how we enable them working in the interoperability lab. Um, the, the other pieces that I mentioned, and this, again, I've, I've talked a lot about how we work with everybody else. Um, we really do a lot of work with our alliance partners to help accelerate everyone's development and not overlap as much as possible. Um, within this NIA Innovations Lab, we also have space for the Redfish Interoperability Lab. Um, they, they host a, a rack of equipment within our, within our lab space. Um, and we have another group within SNEA that we should be announcing their lab space as well that is just ramping up. So we have, you know, three different labs basically all within the same footprint, all working on, you know, interoperability um, testing and, and uh, you know, early access for our uh, member companies. Okay, and maybe just, just as we sort of finish, I mean, either if, if there's anything else we haven't covered, but also, I mean, you hinted there, obviously, that you, you didn't tell us what, but there's another interoperability lab on the horizon. Is there anything else you know, on the roadmap that you're able to you know, let us know a bit more about? Because, I mean, it sounds like you're incredibly busy anyway, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that you need to keep yourself even more busy, but I mean, what else are you looking at doing, I guess? Um, so, so one of the big things we're adding into Swordfish and this, and the whole, you know, storage management ecosystem is, you know, right now focusing on getting some of the feedback from implementations and incorporating those in. Um, we have some other things on the horizon that are fairly straightforward that are like just looking at, um, you know, adding support for NVMe 2.0 that came out last year, all of the work we've done with mapping everything to date has been on the uh, 1.4 base. So we'll be moving all of that over. Um, so our big functionality is really just a pivot to trying to drive folks to help use the lab that we've spent so much time getting up and running and ready for. Uh, we, we know we have some more new equipment coming in shortly. Um, we'd like to encourage others to engage there um, and um, get some more clients engaged. And then uh, the CTP function, um, we expect to have multiple events during this year. Um, we do everything from what we call uh, markathons to testathons to hackathons. Um, so a Mockathon, one of the earliest tools we use in developing anything within the Redfish and Swordfish ecosystems are just mockups. And what we're doing with the mockups um, within, the, within the programs are really, the Mockathon is, if anybody who wants to just get started, um, 
can come and we will help them, you know, either evaluate the existing mockups they have, take it, take our, you know, say, your, what does your system look like? What would you like it to look like? Um, and then as things move along, either if they have full-fledged mockups, they want to run through this, um, or even a, a POC, we move them into what we call a testathon. And a testathon is again, it's a you know, few hour, one day kind of thing, but it's um, we'll take it and we'll help them through walking through running against the CTP testing and say, here's where your gaps are, here's where your issues are. You can go off and, st and start working on those. So we're trying to you know stage these events in to help folks um, understand uh, where they are in the development cycle, where we can help them accelerate um, if they have issues, questions about this that are um, you know, outside the scope of, hey, we found this additional property we need, which is great. That stuff can all happen as well as coming through the twig and the enhanced list of the spec. Um, but the uh, storage management initiative is really there to help with, with all of the rest of these pieces and enabling, you know, hopefully helping everyone to uh, enable their development and accelerate their development as well. Okay, I mean, it's lovely. We've, we've covered a fair amount of ground and, and Richard, I'm really grateful for you spending the time. So thank you very much indeed. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank you. It's great talking with you.